Two balls, two strikes. Spores kicks and fires. He struck him out looking. It's over. It's over. The Rangers have won the World Series. Ranger fans, you're not dreaming. The Rangers are the World Series champions. After 52 years in Texas, 63 years of the franchise, the wait is over. And the celebration has begun. The iconic call from the Hall of Fame, voice of the Texas Rangers, Eric Nadell. One week and one day ago, the Rangers won the World Series for the first time. And Eric is in studio with us tonight on Free For All. Uh, welcome in. I know it's been a crazy week plus for you right now. Let's talk about the call, first of all. And you've been asked this a lot, I know. But how much of it do you plan ahead of time? And how much is just emotion and enthusiasm coming out at the moment? Well, what I planned ahead of time for sure was to say, Ranger fans, you're not dreaming. Ever since the Rangers won the fourth game to go ahead three games to one, I really felt like I was in a dream. Like, we're really going to win the World Series. You know, this is, this is going to happen. And I wanted to assure everybody that, uh, that they weren't dreaming. And still, every day since then, Mike, I've awakened and the first thought to come in my head is the Rangers won the World <laughs> Series. It's, it's eight days now. I'm waking up at six in the morning excited because the Rangers won the World Series. And I'm just riding the wave and I'm wondering when it's going to end. I mean, you started with the club in the late 70s. I mean, did you think it just wasn't going to happen in your time in the broadcast booth? After 2011, I really had that fatalistic attitude that it probably wasn't going to happen, especially when they had those great teams in 2015 and 2016. Got my hopes up again, and then it didn't happen. And then we went through that dark period of six straight losing seasons with over 100 losses two years ago. And it just seemed to me like there's no way they could rebuild this team into a contender you know, in a period of just, you know, two, three, even four years. And uh, when Chris Young got the job, he told me this isn't going to take that long. And uh, he was right. Boy, was he ever. Uh, you were telling me that your responsibilities have been interesting since this happened in terms of uh, some of the, some of your duties as an MC and some, some guest requests from some uh, big-time media organizations too, right? Yeah, I got a call from uh, National Public Radio the other day, and uh, you know, they're interested in running the call and, and talking about it. And I've had radio interviews you know, all over the state of Texas. I had one in San Francisco the other day. And I don't know when it's going to really when it's going to expire. But the San Francisco Giants announcer who I talked to yesterday, Mike Kruko, said it's not going to expire. This coming season, he said, is going to be a Ranger festival. He said Ranger fans are going to come out of the woodwork everywhere you go. There are going to be Ranger fans in every stadium. And, of course, the Rangers will have all kinds of events. You know, they'll have a, a ring night and a raise the pennant night and a championship trophy night and who knows what else as everybody wants to keep this as high in their consciousness as they can. Yeah, there'll be a trip to the White House in your future, things this like that. This is true. Yeah. Also, I imagine we'll be on Sunday Night Baseball probably far more times than we would like. <laughs> yeah. That is, that's one of the, the negatives of winning the World Series. I want to talk to you about it, uh, expectations here in a few minutes and what might happen between now and, and next season. Uh, but when people come to you in years to come and ask, how did this happen? How are you going to answer that? It's this is a, a team that stumbled into the postseason and suddenly they win the World Series. And they win the World Series by winning all 11 road games after having a losing record on the road during the regular season. Uh, they score a lot of runs in these road games after having trouble scoring runs on the road during the regular season. It really doesn't make any sense. I haven't heard any explanation from any of the players or the coaches that really makes any sense other than to go with the old Ron Washington axiom, it's the way baseball go. It's the most unpredictable game in the world, and that's why it's so beautiful. Big players stepped up, big-time players at, at big times. Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon among them, by the way, tonight receiving Silver Slugger Awards for offensive excellence at their positions. And the Rangers won the overall Silver Slugger, the first time there's been a team award there. So the, uh, the postseason awards beginning to pour in already. And as it turned out, the Rangers wound up scoring, you know, as many runs per game in the postseason as they did during the regular season, which is hard to believe considering you're facing, you know, playoff caliber pitching staffs. So to be able to, you know, average over five and a half runs a game in the postseason is remarkable. Teams don't generally do that in the postseason.
All right, uh, the future of the Rangers, the obligatory Otani question. We'll get into that with Eric Nadell and more with the Rangers voice coming up. The Hall of Fame voice of the Texas Rangers, Eric Nadell is our guest tonight. Uh, Eric, obviously you've gotten to know Bruce Bochy in a way that most people in the media don't because before every game that you have called on the, uh, on the radio this year, you had a chance to um, do a pregame show with him. Uh, what struck you about his style? Obviously, you knew him before this year, but what struck you about his style that maybe uh, surprised you a little bit or that, that what, what made him so effective right away in his first year here with the Rangers? Well, I didn't know him at all. I'd met him a couple of times previously, but my cousin played for him briefly with the Giants, uh, a guy named Brian Horwitz. And Brian was uh, one of these players who was a, he was a marginal big league player. He'd go back and forth between the majors and the minors. And he loved Bochy. And he loved the way that Bochy cared for his players. It's the same sort of thing he used to hear about Ron Washington. But uh, Bruce has this calm assertiveness. Uh, and he's also extremely thoughtful and extremely sensitive. And I think that's the part of it that kind of took us all by surprise that we didn't know was there, not knowing him and just seeing the image. You know, he's a very large man. He's got this super deep, fabulous baritone voice <laughs> that we all wish we had. Huge head. Uh, he's known for that. Gigantic Takes head. one to know one, and, by the way, right here. All and right. He, uh, he somehow inspires confidence in everybody. And he knows just the right buttons to push on each individual player. He doesn't spend that much time in the clubhouse, but he has individual meetings with guys. And clearly he's an unbelievable motivator and always has the team in the right frame of mind. And he prevented the team from falling into an irreversible downward spiral when those short losing streaks would happen that always seemed to follow short winning streaks. He confirmed on the fan the other day that he'll be coming back next year. I mean, he'll be 69 years old. Are you tempted at all now that you've uh, experienced this to, to, uh, to step away from the broadcast booth? You know, I really thought going into the playoffs, Mike, that if the Rangers won the World Series, that would be the perfect way to go out. Uh, but since it happened, and since I experienced the joy of the parade and saw the faces of six or seven hundred thousand people just delirious with happiness and realized how much the Rangers mean to people and got all these um, comments you know on the story that Levi Weaver wrote in The Athletic and comments on Twitter and people sending me emails just sending emails to the Rangers that get forwarded to me or finding my email somehow as well as the few hundred friends who sent me texts and emails uh, Next year is going to be a lot of fun, and I don't, I don't want to miss it. And I think probably the, the best I can do to serve society, the best thing I can do is continue to do my job and continue to be warm and open and welcoming to fans. And so, you know, as of now, my plan is to come back. You know, I haven't talked to the powers that be as yet. But I think you're fine. I'll be right. yeah, I, think, I think you'll be all right. I think I built I, up some equity. I know what a trying year it was for you, and I think what those fans are telling you is how much they love you and how much they respect the job that, that you do. I'm really grateful for uh, that. I am. Let's talk about the future a little bit with this Ranger team. The Otani question is out there. That's going to be kind of the tantalizing aspect of this offseason. Reports say that the Rangers are at or near the top of his list. Imagine that. He might want to play for the World Series champions. How realistic do you think it, it is? I don't think any of us really know, Mike. I think it's realistic that the Rangers would pursue him. You know, they tried to get him in a trade. And I don't believe they were planning to get him as a rental. They were planning to have him play here the last two months and then sell him on staying here. So I'm sure they'll go after him. Where he wants to live, I imagine, is going to be the determining factor. You know, if he enjoys living in L.A. and he's now had six years doing that, uh, he'll probably sign with the Dodgers. If he's not sure that's where he wants to live and the Rangers get to bring him in for a recruiting visit and he starts talking to players on the Rangers, you know, just as Max Scherzer was convinced by that process and Jacob deGrom was convinced by that process, uh, Otani might might buy into it as well. You know, I don't really know much about him. He seems to be a very private person, and I don't think anyone has a read for what he really wants. Obviously, he wants a lot of money, and he's going to get it from wherever he eventually signs, but there are probably at least four or five teams that are willing to give him you know, in the sort of price range he'll be talking about. Yeah, as we wrap up, we referenced expectations. Spring training will be here before we know it, like 12 or 13 weeks from now. 
it'll be unlike any other spring training in Ranger history, clearly, with what is expected of this team right off the bat, so to exactly. speak. Exactly. And, you know, they're not going to lose much. You know, they might lose Jordan Montgomery, and that's another guy who I would imagine they'll pursue, and he'll probably want to come back. But there'll be some new faces probably in the bullpen. Um, Mitch Garver, questionable whether the Rangers will be able to afford him or not. But the core of the team is going to be there. And the Rangers will have a full year out of Evan Carter. They've got Wyatt Langford knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. If that DH spot does open up and the Rangers don't have uh, Garver here and they don't have Otani, then you would think that the Rangers have the possibility of breaking camp with, uh, with a Wyatt Langford as a fourth outfielder slash DH, and that'll really be fun to see. But I would imagine there'll be some veterans as well you know, in that picture. But the starting rotation you know, returns everybody except Montgomery, and then maybe Montgomery stays, and if not, maybe they get a, a similar caliber pitcher to replace him. So I imagine the Rangers will go into the season as the favorite in our division. And a healthy Scherzer, presumably, to start the year. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Nadell, so happy for you. Continue to enjoy Thanks. this thing here in, in the coming weeks and months. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for Thanks coming. Thanks for having in. me.